Baptist Church, and welcome to our midweek moment. I am your host, Minister Dennis Foster. As I've been here with you the entire month, we are uh, again doing another segment of Brother to Brother, uh, basically where we talk about lessons on manhood, fatherhood, and brotherhood, and just what it means to be a better father, a better brother, a better, a better uncle, a better mentor, a better friend, and all of those things. And so uh, we are so excited for this last and final installment. I am so lucky to have my friend and my brother here, Trey, uh, who is with us all the way from St. Louis. Um, and so we're grateful to have him. And so Trey, just take a moment to introduce yourself to the people, tell them what you do. Cool. Hey everybody, my name is Trey Bond. Go by Trey, as you can hear. I've uh, been knowing Dennis for the last um, six or so years since I uh, first started college here in Chicago. Not native to Chicago, from St. Louis. Um, or Cardinals, not Cubs, or White Sox. <laughs> That's it again. Um, yeah, I, I uh, live in St. Louis. Uh, I work as a policy advocacy fellow, um, the police reform, public safety transformation space. Um, so, never a dull day there. I'm super excited to, to be here and to talk with you all and Dennis. Yes, we are so glad to have you. Um, I don't know what he's talking about with the whole White Sox thing, but uh, or the Cardinals, but you know, yeah, we, can, we can agree. We can agree yeah, on our disdain. Okay, series. okay. We can agree on our disdain for the Cubs. Um, mm -hmm, okay, right. Okay, yes. yes we can agree. We can absolutely. Agree. Yes, we can agree absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So let's just jump right into it. I got a few questions that I want to ask you. Um, just to pick your brain about and uh, we'll get started with that all right cool. so um this month we have uh seen some very interesting things happen uh happen right so like there was uh the legislation that allowed for juneteenth to be recognized as an official holiday mm -hmm. we've also seen the conviction of um the uh derek chauvin uh who was uh george floyd's uh murderer yeah. And so um, we've seen a lot happen, especially in the last year alone, uh, since the George Floyd protests um, of people, you know, talking about justice and it being a hot topic. Right. And so um, my question to you is, is that do you feel hopeful about the current trend of justice that we see? Or uh, if so, or if not, what do you think needs to happen to push the needle further in the right direction? Yeah, um, I think that justice, the way that's going nowadays, is uh, both good and bad. Um, or not bad, good, and also there's like some room for growth and there's room for some deeper conversations around how we can actually structurally change yeah. um, our societies. I think on the one hand, um, it's good that nowadays most people, whether you're you're black, white, or whatever, you know, where you're from, at least in America, you have access to like so much information it's kind of hard for people to not know about segregation you know slavery the legacies of slavery um racial in inequities that exist today um you know if you, if you don't know about those things at least a little bit you're probably choosing to Absolutely. not know um, so uh that's a good thing that, that that information is being prevalent i think a lot of our political conversations a lot of our um uh and i mean I'm, we may live in a bubble but like social media and, and a lot of the conversations we have online um it's, it's geared toward, you know, justice is geared toward um, siding with those who are oppressed, siding with those who are on the uh, bottom end of things. Um, I think on the other hand, there's a few things that's happening that's like not so good. I think, you know, with the proliferation of like social media and um, just like the access to information that we have nowadays on the internet, um, there is just a lot of room for like a lot of superficiality when it comes to um, justice, quote unquote. Uh, I think the legislation of Juneteenth is good in and of, of itself, but it is something that doesn't really structurally, structurally change. I think there's an argument to say <clears throat> that it helps like set the precedent, precedent as a nation to like change the mental models of people like, across the country. However, it really doesn't get at the root of like why we have inequality, which is like you know, you know we have we don't have affordable housing, we don't have an equi equity in education, we don't have. Good healthcare system, you know, basic things I think that we all <laughs> need yeah, to, to live as people. Um, so I think there's like a lot of room for like people to like post on social media, to say that they're, they're for justice, but not actually like be involved in the work personally in their work. Like that's challenging, like watch the premise here, challenging like these systems. And then also, I think another area of growth is even when we do get 
like semblances of like instances of like true justice like for the first like Derek Chauvin was just you know sentenced to 22 years in prison um that instance in and of, in of itself like well of course I don't even know what justice means you know like I mean George Floyd is, or yeah George Floyd is dead like he's, he doesn't get his life back absolutely sentencing Derek Chauvin to 22 years really doesn't do much you know I mean it gives, maybe it gives some peace to the family but that really doesn't solve much and you kind of see sometimes like systems give up one of theirs <laughs> You know, as a scapegoat to say, oh, we gave him this 22 years. You know, his even his own police chief, you know, was saying things Absolutely. against him. You know, they kind of like threw him to the dogs. You know, and kind of use him as a scapegoat to have like to shield themselves from like larger conversations yep. about how the whole system is is implicit in the murder of George Floyd and how there's multiple people, institutions that should be held accountable and taking their power away from them and money. You know, to yep. to think about these things. So, um, so yeah, you kind of have like both people who are like we don't know the superficial. You know, social justice people and also like just mismatched or misaligned like actual like structural changes that aren't really what we're asking for you know yeah. we're asking for jobs we're not asking for 22 years. i mean like maybe that's good for some people 22 years in prison for their show but like that's just one instance of like how many absolutely so um yeah. so yeah just some more thoughts on that yeah no i i agree um i think that like we've seen a lot of novelty mm-hmm. you know in the last uh year especially um, I think I was just lit, reading an article recently that talked about the idea that like there were like a bunch of companies that like uh, planned to like give a whole bunch of money to like black yeah. um, uh, efforts that would like lead to progression in like neighborhoods and communities and stuff like that and like 0.05% of those organizations actually went, came through like on those promises to like deliver you know, oh. says, like money to those groups. Which is like, oh, so the weird. Promised yes, the they, they promised, did. but they didn't give it. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, everybody last year was just kind of like, we're promising to do this and do that or whatever. Yeah. But literally, that's like, it's like moment in the moment. Like, yes. Like in the moment. Like that's, yeah. It's just, Absolutely. Yeah. Everybody felt as if like they were on the right side of things, like as it pertained to the whole George Floyd situation, right. and what it means to like be supportive of black folks and, uh, you know, the movements of justice, but like yeah, again, saying like yeah, saying Black Lives Matter, that's the bare minimum. Absolutely, <laughs> like thank you. Yes, like absolutely. <laughs> um, but like yeah, you know, there being all of this novelty, but no real like follow through. Right. Um, and so yeah, I think that I agree. You know, in a lot of ways that like there's a lot of room for growth um, overall, um, which just kind of like leads to uh, my next question, and it just kind of is. Uh, how important is it for us as uh, black men to come alongside others in the other movements uh, happening around us? And are we as supportive as we can be to those other movements? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think black men are um, always pushed within black communities as like the leaders of like families, as the you know um, the ones that set the precedent for how we you know go about as like families, as communities, as church community. Um, a lot of our leaders are men. Um, a lot of our pastors are men. Um, a lot of our teachers, writers are men, black men, uh, within the black church, within the black, black community. Um, I think sometimes that reality can get in the way of us actually showing up for those who need us, you know, yeah. in, in the space. Um, talking about black, black women, um, those others you may not, you know, agree with, like black trans people, like they are people as well, they're God's children too. Absolutely. Um, you know, those who are not black men um, and those who don't conform to what we think of as a black man as this like macho, you know, pro- pro- provider, protector of his family. Yeah. Um, if we don't show up for those people, then like we're not following, first we're not following the teachers of Jesus, you know, one who, you know, naturally gravitated towards those who are less and least in society. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, looking at our past movements, you know, we can say without a doubt that black women were the ones who led the structural changes of, you know, those movements. Like, yes, the face may have been like black men, but um, when you look at the background, look at all the work that has been done, look like the strategies that were implemented all came from black women. Um, black women, you know, keep families together. You know, they are, they give life and they keep life. Um, so, I, yeah, I think we can do a lot of work showing up for other groups and other people. Um, you know, we need to, like, decenter ourselves. It is true that black men are, like, statistically killed um, has a higher rate of higher chance of being killed by police than probably any other group in the U.S. And it's also true that um, you know 
black women and other groups are economically behind black men, you know, like that's the truth. So how do we reconcile that? How do we like show up when we need to show up? How do we not scapegoat into arguments like, oh, you know, if we had, yes, we need black fathers back in the house, that's the truth, you know, and there's like issues around like, you know, fatherhood and how that's affected black communities. Also, the reasons are deeper than that. Yes, <laughs> and they're like, yeah, that's how I feel like that's like very superficial thing to say sometimes, you know, to, to arguments around like, how do we structurally change our, our communities. I mean, there are plenty, plenty of families with like two parent households that are still struggling and are still way behind and still, yeah, absolutely. you know, like what's the difference? So, um, so yeah, like, I feel like maybe, we need more nuance. We just need more. That's good. We need more education. Yeah. Like we need to like not make things so simple and like stop using arguments. It's just simple arguments to like big complex things. You yeah. know, based on that's how things always have been, or you know, or shutting down black women's ideas, or you know, not letting black women lead. <laughs> um, and like taking power away from ourselves. You know, we have a lot of power in black community. So how do we like kind of lessen ourselves and decenter ourselves and give up power so that others can have voice to issues? And we'll all be better for it. Yeah, so. yeah, that's really good. I think that that's super great. Um, just kind of moving on to our next question. Uh, in what ways have you seen yourself deeply affected by uh, situations of injustice around you? Um, I think growing up as a young, poor black person, <laughs> you are like always exposed to trauma. You're always exposed to, um, you know, injustice or um, you see Due to like lack of economic opportunity, lack of just you know education, um, your friends kind of turn to illicit things, or you know uh, go down the path of um, f- friends and family go down the path of, you know that is not probably best for them and like their future. Um, also, I did grow up in Ferguson, Missouri too, and you know the incident of Michael Brown being shot and murdered by um, Daryl Wilson, a police officer in Ferguson, Missouri, um, was crazy, and it was like a lot for me and everybody that lived there and the world, you know. Well, while that was close to me, I'm also, of course, as a black person, affected by murders like George Floyd and other Maude Aubrey and Brown Taylor um, and all the other black people that are like, constantly killed and surveilled, you know, um, by police. So, uh, so yeah, I think overall, like, there's a lot of trauma being a black person yeah. <laughs> uh, in society that has personally like deeply affected me, and it's kind of helped me kind of shape my passions and like what I want to do. You know, you know, working in like you know police reform and um, working in how to build better systems for us so for sure yeah i think for me i very much so resonate a lot with that um definitely growing up in a very similar background and and seeing a lot of that as well but like also to experiencing a lot of uh, or seeing a lot of the situations that have happened with other black folks like around the country as relates to police and um you know just feeling deeply affected by um you know all of this kind of like surfaced out of you know um, these moments and, and these times, and I think that um, a lot of them, a lot of them have affected me like in a lot of very deep ways. But I think the most, like the one that I felt most deeply, um, was just the Mont Arbery, and like um, just thinking about that last year, and then finding out that we share like the same birthday and we were like the same age, and you know all of those kinds of things. Like it just felt really close, you know, yeah. like just felt like this literally could have been me, you know. Um, and on a jog. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> on a jog, yes, because I, I used to you run, run. absolutely. <laughs> Mind my business, you know, all those kinds of things. And so it's just kind of like, it just feels, it feels surreal, you know. And like, I think that like, um, like we as, as black people in these situations, like, we have to grieve these moments as well, you know, and so like, yeah. just becomes a, it, it, it definitely affects us in a lot of deeper ways, but we have to be intentional about like working through that grief, working through um, those moments that are, are kind of like hitting us in, in really heavy ways. Um, so moving on to our last question, uh, my last question for you is, what is uh, the most important lesson that you've learned as a brother, as a friend, as a mentor, and or father that you would like to share with those watching? Um, I think as a man, um, it gets like more spiritual side, uh, lesson of humility, I think is important as uh, a man to always question myself and to always recognize that I don't have the answers to everything. Um, that shows up in my personal relationship, that shows up in my questions about like complex issues around the world, like why is there injustice, why, you know, um, do 
through certain people have certain outcomes in their lives, you know, like why God did you put me in this position to, to do this or why did you put that person in that position to do that? You know, things that like don't make sense in the natural, I think. Um, allowing myself to, like making my making myself empty so that God can fill me and because he has all the answers to these things. Um, and always believing in faith that he does. I yeah. think that's like saying that God knows everything. Um, it's something that, you know, we say, but like not always, don't always believe. Yeah. Don't always um, really understand like what that means. And it's okay, you know, if we believe it in faith um, and believe that it, it is true. So, um, yeah, I think like just humbling myself and, and emptying myself um, so that I can have answers, so I can be a conduit, you know, to God answering these questions on earth. So, um, so yeah, that's probably the, the, the biggest lesson I've learned in my personal relationships and just like in my work in general. Yeah, um, I agree with that completely. I've mentioned it in sermons before, but like the um, the most the most freeing thing that we as individuals can experience is the idea that like, you know, God is the savior and we're not, you know, and that's kind of like literally what you're saying here. And so um, thank you again, Trey, for uh, being a part of this interview and uh, talking with us on, uh, you know, justice and those things. Um, and so uh, to everybody who's been watching us uh, for the entire month, we thank you for joining us. We thank you uh, for being a part of these conversations with us. Um, if you could, please uh, continue to uh, join us for uh, next month's midweek moments. Um, they're going to be really exciting conversations. And so it's something that you don't want to miss. And uh, I think it's something that you definitely want to tune into. So remember that uh, you can always watch these on Wednesdays at 12 uh, in the afternoon. But you can always go back and watch them on our Facebook page. And so uh, feel free to share uh, this with friends if you know or family if you know that it is something that they would be interested um, in watching. Just want to tell you again that I love you and I'm so grateful that you have decided to join us today. Goodbye and see you later.